Hello, welcome everyone. Let's let everyone get settled for a minute. <clears throat> Hello, so welcome. Um, just make sure that everyone's connected before we start. Brilliant. Well, good evening and welcome to this In Conversation with international best-selling best author Caroline Smales, part of the Writer's Block program at Writing on the Wall. Many of you will already know, um, but for our new faces, Writing on the Wall, or WOW, is the Liverpool City Region's current arts organisation of the year and a dynamic writing charity that celebrates individual and collective creativity across Merseyside. Working in diverse communities, Wild delivers an annual month-long writing festival and a year-round programme of creative projects and activities. I'm Mikey Dunn, I'm the Writing Development Manager at WOW. Caroline Smales is an acclaimed um, uh, writer. Her, uh, her debut, In Search of Adam, was published in 2007. Um, the big issue, North, declared the book an engrossing and touching read from a new talent. Since then, she has written seven additional novels, two novellas, a musical, and co-authored a short story collection. Uh, a film adaptation of her novel, The Drowning of Arthur Braxton, won Best UK Feature at Rain Dance in November two, uh, 2021. And um, she's, pas she's passionate about creative practice. Caroline works as uh, Director of Book Editing at Bubble Cow, as a mentor for writers, as a chair at literary, literary events, and is an Associate um, Lecturer in Creative Writing at LJMU. So before we begin, just to give you a background on Writer's Block, we launched the Writer's Block in the early part of the lockdown to support um, people and combat isolation and address issues exacerbated by the pandemic, such as racism, domestic abuse, mental health, and social isolation. And the Writer's Block combines social engagement, activism, community, and literature since June 2020. It's a unique opportunity for communities to gauge in creative writing, to see where their writing can take them, working alongside WOW's creative community and led by an award-winning writer. Uh, there will be opportunities to ask questions towards the end, so please do pop your thoughts and questions into the chat and we'll come to them. And with that, we'll begin this in-conversation event. Um, today we'll be looking and discussing uh, Caroline Rice's success as a working class writer and the barriers she's faced along the way. Um, so Caroline, thank you so much for being here. Okay. Um, I think it's always best to start with uh, when you first fell in love with writing. When did you first realise that you could write? Gosh, um, that's like, when did I realise I could write? I don't know if writers ever think they can write. I think there's this kind of, you know, we're starting with a negative, I'm not being negative. I just, um, yeah, I think if, if we pause and think about, oh yes, we, we've done it, we can write now, there's kind of, does that mean I stop? Um, there's a need to kind of always up my game to keep going all the time. Um, so I think I have, what I'd class is a kind of tempestuous, love of writing sometimes I love it sometimes I hate it um it depends on where I am in the writing process at the time so at the minute I'm between 15 to 30 thousand words in my new novel so I hate it I'm at the hate I'm not in love with writing I hate it probably the worst time to have me um but yeah no I'm in a I'm in a kind of hate relationship with it it's one of those where it feels like I'll never get there mm -hmm. um and each book that I write has a different demand on me, different kind of process. So I've always written. Um, and I guess if I'm gonna look at why I love writing, because for me, writing has always been a tool to process emotion. It's kind of been a chance to, um, to voice what I'm struggling to say in real life. So even through my teen years, I would write really, really bad poetry that no one will ever see, but it allowed me to kind of process um things that I didn't understand and even now it does every every novel that I write you can kind of chart my life and my experiences through my novel um, and through my growth as an adult really um so for me I love writing because it gives me a voice and I'm obsessed with um lost women and giving them voices as well and I love books because I love authors and I love that they give voice to these stories as well so that's kind of a long-winded 
uh, approach. So I've kind of said I hate writing when I love books, but yeah, that's very much. I definitely recognize a lot of those things. I think whenever I'm working on any type of project that involves writing, I think who would do this to themselves? Who would, <laughs> who would put them through themselves through this trauma? Um, it's it's a, definitely a very, very difficult thing to get into, but do you feel like you have to write? Is there something that, put, that you, you can't stop writing? Yeah, I think um, during lockdown, especially, I think it was um, one of those, because everything shifted to online, and my head was really full at the time. I didn't feel like I'd, I'd actually just finished a novel, so I wasn't writing. And I found, um, I started doing cross-stitch. I'd never done anything like that before. And I realized that I need this creative outlet. I needed, I couldn't find the space to write. My, you know, it just wasn't working for me at that time when we first went into lockdown. And I think that that recognition that because, oh, for that to be my coping mechanism, and I hadn't realized it was my code mechanism and it helps. And like, sometimes I'll write a whole book and I'll think it's about one thing and then someone will read it and go, oh, it's about this, isn't it? And I'm like, oh yeah, actually, you know, it really is. Like my last published novel was about grief. Um, and I never realized it was about grief and I'd had like a major event happening in my real life and I'd written it out and I never realized that that's what I was doing. So that's been quite a, a current realization that I need that in my life and I think, even if I wasn't published, I would still be writing all the time. It's interesting how many working class writers that I speak to always link their writing to um, personal well-being, um, that they write because it, it actually helps them in some sort of way. Uh, you've been quite open about your background as a working class writer. Uh, do you feel that the literary uh, industry embraces working class stories? Oh, um, yeah, um, so my background, uh, I come from a working class background. Um, I didn't grow up with books. I didn't actually read a book until I was 16. And um, I think that a lot of the things that I write are about giving voice to people who weren't heard. And that's how I felt growing up. I didn't feel like I was heard. Um, my view of the world, I would say, is very left wing. and. Um, I'd say, if I'm being polite, I'd say that some of the industry embraces anything they think they can sell. Mm. And that's perhaps <laughs> being, um, being cynical, but I'd say that um, they're prepared to jump onto not all of the industry, but some, because ultimately it's business. And they'll jump onto making sure that um, they're seen to be giving voice to working class people um for others for others indies for other but some of the bigger publishers and yeah I do think to a certain extent um perhaps not always deliberately I feel like I'm being really kind of careful here but I'll give you an example for you which might help demonstrate it so um I've written two novels that have been set in Liverpool the first novel that I wrote that was set in Liverpool was under a different name I'll talk about by that a bit later um, and it was a commercial novel and it involved the Beatles and it involved um, Mal Evans, the Beatles roadie. So that was embraced, that's my most successful novel. Then I wrote a novel that the one after that was set in Liverpool and um, it was about a 17 year old working class girl from Liverpool, very Northern um, and it's about St Nicholas and uh, the retelling of the St. Nicholas myth, which obviously di is directly linked to Liverpool because he's the patron saint of Liverpool. Um, and my agent at the time said to me that she really liked the novel, but would I consider rewriting it and setting it either in London or Paris because, and this is a direct quote, nobody wants to read about a working class girl from Liverpool. <laughs> right, so that's what I was up against. Um, so that really shocked me. I was actually at work at the time and I'd taken the phone call and had to go in to teach afterwards. And I remember just, I just burst into tears because it was like such a, you know, it had to be Liverpool. It was the essence. It's about the city. It was um, about the dialect. It was about um, the embracing of people who are outsiders who don't quite fit in as well. You know, it's all of that. Um, so anyway, I ended my relationship with my agent about a week later and 
um, I, the, the novel went on to be published by an indie publisher who got it, um, you know, and it, it, the novel had a really good reception, had amazing reception in Liverpool. So I think that it's, although there might be embracing of working class, I think it has to fit into a certain kind of category and literary kind of, um, literary kind of style as well. And I was also told like not to make sure that I didn't have much um, Scouse dialect in there because that would be harder to translate for foreign rights and things like that. So I think that I'm kind of, I have mixed views on it, but I've given an example for other people to kind of make up their mind on that. But this isn't, this isn't the case of the publishing industry, of all the publishing industry, just, just some, just some people. So, it, I mean, it's amazing that you pushed back there. You did, did you, you did refuse in the end to, to change it. Yeah, God, yeah, yeah. She's set in Liverpool. Um, <laughs> she's, she's proud Scouser and um, it had to be set in Liverpool. But that's, I guess the thing is, I'm like, that was my seventh novel. Um, and I do wonder what would have happened if it had been my debut. Would I have said, okay, yes, and just changed it all and, and lost that kind of sense of place and, and, um, perhaps it would be more successful. But for me, it's about um, integrity in what I write as well. Um, it always has to be. But that's, I guess, I'm, I'm in a privileged position because I'm so many novels down that I, I can afford to do that. But, you know, it, it's not going to be the case perhaps for, for other people. I don't know. Um, so just, just on a similar vein, your work, you, you're, as an author, you're known for both contemporary and experimental fiction. So uh, one of your novels um, famously has 11 endings, <laughs> 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 which uh, when we were talking about, you know, making things difficult for yourself as a writer, just as just getting into it, it's, it's quite a thing to take on writing a novel. But writing a novel with 11 <laughs> endings must have been quite... <laughs> Uh, yeah. what was the what was the reaction to your more unconventional works okay so um my debut um so the debut novel that I wrote kind of it was classed as um literary fiction and it was experimental in terms of its format and its font so it kind of used a lot of white space um and it had some drawings in it and it kind of it was uh, the protagonist was a very small you know, 11 year old girl um, and it kind of fit and it had something to say. So that was kind of experimental fiction, literary fiction. You get lots of interest in it and lots of press, but it doesn't always reflect in sales. Um, and then one of my next novels, I ended up killing off the protagonist. So that's quite an unusual thing to do, you, but you know at the beginning that she's gonna die by the end of the novel. And the reaction to that was that people, some people absolutely hated it through the book, like we were talking online, perhaps throwing the book across the room, throwing it in the bin. And then other people loved it because they felt like it was the right thing to do. And uh, so at that time I'd been asked, because um, it was like changing technology, it's I've been really fortunate, but I was asked to write a novel that would only ever be a digital only novel. Um, so it would never be printed. And at the time, um, they were kind of, the idea was that, so in the past, when we went from radio to television, initially people would, the radio presenters would just stand in front of the cameras and do exactly the same as they did on the radio and not think about the cameras. So at the time, eBooks were becoming more popular, but all we were doing were taking books in the book format and putting them into eBook format. So the publisher said to me, we can do something different here. So what they decided to do was build an app around whatever book I wrote, they were going to build an app around it and have it a bit more interactive and something that was slightly different. So I decided to write a novel with 11 endings, partly because I was fed up of, of like the reviews going, oh, I don't like the ending, don't like the ending. So I was like, right, okay, I'll let the reader choose their own ending. <laughs> That'll be the perfect, the, everyone will read the book to a certain point. And then the app that was built, you spun away a wheel on um, on iBooks, you spun a wheel and you got an ending. And the endings were like a Tarantino ending, a happily ever after ending. Um, there was like a, a, a zombie ending. They're all a bit random, but all about storytelling. Um, and what happened was the book exploded, like the press all around the world. Um, I was on breakfast TV and sitting on the sofa being interviewed, but it was really odd because so 
they got this other author on to argue against me to say that I was lazy because it's my responsibility as an author to write one ending but you know I shouldn't give the responsibility to the reader that that's a lazy thing to do so it was like a kind of like it was a, it was a mad situation but yeah it kind of rocketed my career um didn't get any foreign rights off it but it made it kind of pushed me into the public eye so what I decided to do kind of off the back of that was like all right I can write experimental fiction but can I write commercial fiction can I what happens if I write a book that doesn't have any fonts isn't experimental it's purely storytelling so I did and they published that under a slightly different name and much to my horror and disappointing that is my most successful book yeah and I absolutely hate that it is um but yeah it's sold around the world it's because experimental fiction I love it so much but it just doesn't sell as much as kind of commercial fiction does um right. which is a real shame that's a that's really but it's it's so weird that someone would say that you were lazy for writing 11 endings because obviously you would have to have woven in yeah. plot points so that each ending made sense yeah it was an absolute nightmare to write <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it was the hardest thing I've ever written. And then, but I understand the argument because, mm. like, I should decide which ending was best and I should have stuck to that. Mm. But it was about using technology as well. And it was about kind of exploring all these things that we could do because we've got all this technology available to us now as writers. And, um, you know, they've tried it with ebooks, haven't they, where they'll put like geotags and different things in where you can click on, but nobody seems to like it because it stops the flow of the narrative. You know, if you have to like, it's like getting a footnote when you're reading, you don't really want to jump to the bottom of the page. You want to carry on reading. So um, yeah, it was, it was really interesting. It was a really interesting experiment, but the, the kind of press and exposure that came after it and this was in 2013. I think I just wasn't expecting that. And, um, you know, it's still, I'll talk about that later, but yeah. Um, so just just going back to your, your debut, before you eventually found the literary agent and got, got published, how, did you face much rejection? Oh, I'm... Um, I tell my story about how I got published and honestly it makes every writer in the world hate me <laughs> but I will say I will say that it hasn't been a smooth journey I, I absolutely promise you it hasn't but what happened was um so I was um working and I was and I'd gone back I got pregnant when I was a student and years later I'd gone back and thought right I'm going to continue with my studies now um and so I was doing a, a PhD and um, I was doing it in linguistics and, and then I had a miscarriage and I started writing to, like I said before, to kind of get through the grief and get through it, I started writing. And then I realized that after about 30,000 words, I realized that actually I didn't want to be doing linguistics anymore, I wanted to write. And it was one of those real like bizarre realizations where it's like, you know what, I just want to write. I love writing. I just want to write. Um, and so I decided to um, go on a creative writing course because I thought, right, OK, this is going to legitimize it. It's going to mean that I, I have to write because I had like small children and I'm going to have to write. And this will mean that, you know, I, I can make excuses because I can't put the children to bed. You know, I've got to do other things. So that kind of thing. Um, so. I did that and then I, I wrote the novel in a year and it was a time when blogging was becoming really, really popular. So I started a blog and on the blog, I kind of um, put my first chapter and I was like, look, I don't know. I don't know anybody. I didn't know anyone in the industry. I didn't have a clue. Um, I didn't even I didn't know anything about agents, didn't know anything about publishers. Didn't, didn't, so I was like blogging, going, I don't know what I'm doing here. You know, I've written this novel. I don't know what I'm doing. And then this amazing guy um, who'd been, who just had a book out, kind of came on. He's like, you know, have you thought about doing this? Have you thought about doing that? And I was like, oh, you are so nice. Thank you for all the advice. I'll buy your book. So I bought his book from Walt Stones and Liverpool. And then I put my blog, look, I bought this book. And um, the guy on his blog said, oh, look, Caroline's bought my book. And then his publisher went onto my blog, read the first chapter, emailed me and said, I love this. Can I see the rest of it? And three days later, I had a publishing deal. Oh, my goodness. 
I, I'm not going to lie, that is a bit jammy. <laughs> it's, it's totally and utterly um, awful. And it was an indie publisher and um, they ended up, like, I feel like I'm kind of like, please, it's not, it's not plain sailing, but they did end up going into liquidization, uh, liquidization, liquidation, um, <laughs> liquidation about four years later. Um, but then Harper Collins took me on and, you know, it's, wow. yeah, it, it's, it all turned out okay. Um, mm -hmm. But again, I still didn't know what I was doing. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't have an agent. Um, so yeah, I didn't have the rejection program. I have had since, I would say, but um, I didn't have kind of rejections and all of that kind of, maybe if I knew that I wouldn't have written and I wouldn't have done it. I think naivety sometimes is really good you know, um, and mm -hmm. writing my debut was the freest thing I've ever written because I didn't have to think about anything. You know, I just I just got to write. And I think there is something lovely about not having to think about the industry. You know, you can Definitely. know too much. Um, so that kind of brings us on to the next bit because of course your debut is the, you know, your first publishing, uh, your first published novel is one thing, but then to you have to. It's no guarantee that you're going to get published again. But you, you've really been prolific with uh, your work, um, especially for a creative person. Because starting a project yeah. <laughs> is one thing, but finishing it is another for a creative mind. Um, so, what have been your best and worst experiences of the publishing process since your debut? Okay, um, best and worst. Right, worst. I'd say every novel at 15 to 30,000 words, because I hate 15 to 30,000 words. Um, <laughs> that's my worst, all my worst. But actually my worst was, um, uh, there's lots of, there are lots of bad things in publishing. Yeah, like in anything, there are lots of bad things and rejection's horrible. Sometimes getting feedback's horrible. You know, you have to, it's really odd. You have to have this hardened skin, um, but then have the kind of, emotional openness to be able to write it's a really odd balance I had a really horrible review uh once I've had lots of horrible reviews but I, I had a really horrible one that stuck to mind but that's not really worth voicing actually the worst thing was uh the unexpected exposure after uh, the novel with 11 endings came out because I wasn't expecting um I was naive about the online world I'm not anymore. Um, I used to talk about my children. I used to kind of talk about, not where I lived, but like if I was going somewhere, I just, I, you know, we're, we're told now to make sure you lock accounts and all that kind of things. But at that time in, in 2013, I, I was quite naive about it. And um, because of all the kind of attention I was getting online, this online trolling website decided to go after me. Oh and goodness. it was absolutely terrifying. Yeah, they just kind of went like comments, reposting things, talking about my children. Um, and that was a really kind of shocking side of publishing that I hadn't even considered. Um, so I think it, it was good in that it, it, gave, it was a wake up call and it made me kind of go, OK, I need to lock everything down. I need to be um considered and careful about what I'm putting out there and I need to think about my writer persona and the platform and all that kind of stuff which I've developed over the years but yeah I'd say that was the worst and um, the best I would say oh there's lots of there are lots of best things I'd say the seed of an idea when you get an idea and you it's kind of like falling in love you know or like that moment with a new lover you know it's all very romantic and wonderful so I think the seed of an idea and um, when you get emails from agents, publishers kind of saying, I love this, or can I publish you, or we've sold your book abroad, all that kind of thing. Because um, international sales, like foreign rights sales, my favorite thing. Having the book in different editions is my most favorite thing. And I've just had a film premiere as well. So that's quite, there's so many amazing things. Like, you know, we wouldn't do this unless there were really, I think. I think we'd, we'd write, but to put, to put our work out there, there's a difference between writing and actually giving your writing to other people to judge. Absolutely. So um, there are lots of positives. See, I love it really. <laughs> Turn it around. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Um, so 
as well as writing prose, I, I didn't know this about you actually. I was quite I was quite interested to read about this. So um, in March of 2020, you worked on the script for a musical, The Color of Light. So how did you get involved in writing a musical and how much different was it, uh, the process to writing prose? Oh, it was um, madness, absolute madness. Um, an amazing experience, but weirdly it feels like a lifetime ago now because um, it actually was shown the week before we went into lockdown. So it was like, well, it was like everything, will, will it happen, will it not? You know, because we knew we were going to go into lockdown, you know, at that time. Anyway, um, there was a lovely, lovely uh, Liverpool composer called Anne Taft, uh, who was part of the Sense of Sound singers from Liverpool as well. Um, and so I got contacted um, in the December before and Anne and I met with Anne and Jennifer John and we had a discussion because Anne had this kind of all these songs that she'd already written and they wanted to put on a musical so it was a really odd experience because the songs already existed okay there were loads of songs and they were amazing and I had to try and write a narrative around the songs okay so the songs were offered in like a chronological order I had to offer a narrative around them um, there had to be two characters and then six other women on stage at all times. Um, so I had, it was the most stressful experience. I had limited creativity, less space for storytelling and words than I've ever had before, less character development than I've ever had before, had to rely on the songs and the lyrics that already existed. And I had six weeks to write it. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So it was um it was beautiful. It was so it was such I mean the sense of sound singers are I'm sure that many people have heard them. They're they are sensational. Um but it was the most unusual experience. So I had that just before Christmas and then they went into rehearsals in like end of January into February. Um there was no get in on the day, so there's no like it was straight in and there was a performance in the afternoon, the performance in the evening. It was absolutely incredible. Um, and then it was locked down the next week and it's kind of, okay, what do we do with it now? So I think it's something that we'll revisit and go back to. Um, but it was just so lovely being part of the city as well. And, you know, it was like, it was a Scouse musical as well. It, you know, and it was just, there was something, I don't know about just all women getting together and just, creating something and then it sold out in both the shows and then lockdown hit so yeah it was entirely different I'm not sure if I love writing dialogue but I'm not sure if I'm a script writer because obviously I think tell I talk too much and I say too much in my writing you know I'm used to like longer amounts of words um but yeah it's an amazing experience and we might go back to it oh brilliant well um as as a rapper I I've noticed that you you um, are willing to work on musicals, so it's it's noted, it's stored up here. <laughs> <laughs> the <Yeah>. future, wink. <laughs> <That's> fine. <laughs> um, so, um, if you could pick your top three tips for new writers, what would they be? Top three, okay. Um, and we're talking brand new writers. Brand new writers, okay. I think that. The most overwhelming thing about writing um, is kind of, you know, I said before, like 15 to 30,000 words, that's my worst point because it just, writing a novel is huge and it just feels like an overwhelming task. So anyway, I always, I always write in chapters and think of them like short stories. But I would say that my kind of best advice that I could give is first of all, to do, to set yourself tiny word targets for each day. Because I genuinely believe that the way to write is to write every day. If you leave huge gaps, then you lose a sense of voice, you lose a sense of setting. We change our voice, a narrative voice changes as well over time. So I'd say to set tiny word targets to so make that 300 words or make that 400 words and make it small. And that's what you've got to do every day. Because if you say, I'm going to write 3,000 words a day and then you only write 2,500 words, you leave the day feeling really rubbish about yourself. You almost feel like a failure. And it's like, no, you've still written like 2,500 words. That's amazing. If you set, say, 300 words, 
and you write a thousand words, then you come away thinking, I am the best writer in the world. I'm amazing. <laughs> yeah, it, it works. It does something. Because every day, if you're not hitting your word tar- target, you're kind of thinking, why am I bothering with this? Um, so I do that. That's what I do. And I do that. It's like tricking your brain. Um, I always end the day knowing what I'm going to write the next day. So oh, okay. if I'm going to write 300 words, sometimes I, I would stop at 300 words and not write anymore and then just write some bullet points. And it meant that when I sat down the next day, if my time's limited, I don't have to think, what am I going to write today? Oh, no, I don't know what I'm going to write because I'll just kind of go, I've made some bullet points here. I know where I start and it'll stop me procrastinating and spending five hours on Twitter for no reason whatsoever. So I always do that. Um, I would also say to learn your craft. And that sounds really odd, um, but like learning about punctuation, learning about show, don't tell, learning about how to lay out dialogue. All these little things are really important. They're not important necessarily when you're just writing, but they will be if you ever want to show your work to, to someone else. Because you don't want the person reading it being distracted by the fact that you haven't learned your craft, you don't know these things. And they're so easy to learn, like Google or just opening any book, opening any novel and seeing how someone else is doing it. Um, But it kind of, you don't want someone reading your work and and thinking, oh, look, you know, being distracted by what you're not doing rather than reading your story. So I'd say that, get that nailed as soon as possible. Um, When I started writing, I didn't know how to do dialogue. And I, and I avoided doing dialogue for years, mm-hmm. you know, just, I didn't want to do dialogue. And then someone's like, well, why haven't you got dialogue in this my actual <laughs> debut before, before it was published? Someone was like, I didn't put any dialogue at all. And they were like, well, why? And I was like, well, I don't know how to do it. So I avoided doing it because no one never taught me. So I think it's really important to, do, to learn that kind of thing. That's three, but I'd actually give an extra one. It's not, but just celebrate celebrate every success you know celebrate every time you hit a word count you know I don't mean bad habits forming here but just like feel proud of yourself for doing it and enjoy the journey you know a little bit more I think it's it's important that you celebrate from hitting your word counts to anything that comes later on you know that help you've did they're, they're brilliant that's brilliant advice um so you <laughs> you've pinpointed a point at the when you get to a certain point in the novel was it 15 to thirty thousand words that you yeah. that's your least favorite part of the novel um is there any point that you get stuck what 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 do you do when you're really really stuck um okay so I, for me, a novel doesn't, my novels don't exist until 15 to 30,000 words. I think I've just got it in my head. Like, you know, it's, it's not real until that moment. Um, I think that I sometimes kind of relate it. Do you know when you get into bed at night and you know you need to go to sleep, but your brain's really active and you'll just lie there kind of like waiting to go to sleep and actually you should probably just get up and do the thing that you're thinking about. You know, that's like stopping you from sleeping. Sometimes I think like writing's like that as well. Like you can't force it. And, you know, if you're sitting down and it's not coming and you're just kind of sitting here and you're sitting at your desk kind of thinking, you know, you're you're so bad, everyone else can write or whatever. You know, all these stupid thoughts that go in your head, but actually doing something else. So for me, um, when I go for a drive, I often think, or if I go for a walk or if I do something, it's almost like I'm saying to my brain, right then, you're not behaving, I'm going to do something else. And like the tantrumy child that it is, the minute I start doing something else, it's like, no, 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 give me attention and I have to come back. Um, so I do that. And also I do bullet points. If I can't write, I'll make bullet points. So I'm still kind of writing, but I'm just going, okay, like how about like, this is what this scene should look like. And then I'll pad it out when my brain's behaving a little bit better. So it's just kind of tricks to, um, it's really easy to give excuses not to do things, you know? So it's just kind of a trick. I trick my brain all the time. Um, so anyone else who has to do that or finds writing hard it's normal honestly no matter it, it gets harder with each novel it really does um, <laughs> but you just you just keep going and you you find the things that work and if that be you know doing exercise or going and cooking or you know and you'll come back to it and um, when I there was a time when I gave up I gave up all work and was just writing so I'd have all day like when the kids were at school I'd have all day to write and I swear I did it every single day in the last hour before I had to come pick them up 
it was like my brain was going, oh, you've got all day. It's fine. I work better in like small amounts. So just find the thing that works, that works best for you to make sure you get it done. Because writers write. It's as simple as that. You know, you just, you'll find a way. Um, and just tagging on to that, how do you, how important do you think it is to read? Read material. Yeah, it's really, it's really important. It is right. You know, reading is the thing. Um, I get, because when I teach this as well, and you get lots of people saying, yeah, I'm, I'm going to write fantasy and they've not read any fantasy books or, you know, you need to know your genre that you're, that you're writing in. You need to be able to position what you're writing in the market. You need to kind of, um, know the industry and you get that from reading but I would say that when I'm writing I can't read which is really odd um I can't read anything in this similar genre I can I can read non-fiction um so in the months of the year that I'm writing so for six months of the year I'll be writing intensively and the other six months I'll be editing and reworking it in the editing and reworking six months of the year I can read anything but in the time when I'm writing I can't read at all so you know before you start writing or when you're when you're researching, looking at other books in the similar genre and reading them, I think it's absolutely essential. Um, just to know, to know the market and to know how it works and make sure that you're not um, being kind of a cliche or, or jumping on tropes and stereotypes because that's how you think it should be because the industry changes and voices change and it's always useful to read modern books as well as classics. Um, I'll tag on uh, a piece of advice for anyone because my attention span is really, really bad. And I love reading, but I find novels daunting to get a thing. So I have to, I kind of do what you do. I kind of say, I'm going to read this many pages and then if I do over, that's great. But also it's, um, there's loads of great um, short pieces that you can read. Um, a great one is The New Yorker. They do fantastic. They publish fantastic short stories. Um, so it's well worth looking there. Um, so thank you for answering all my questions, Caroline. I'm okay. sure we've got some audience questions. And I just wanted to say before we uh, continue, um, having been taught by you at LGMU, I just wanted to thank you because you were one of the, uh, in fact, you were the, you were my favourite tutor. Yeah. Um, you instilled a lot of confidence in me. Um, and I've gone on to do pretty well off the back of the encouragement you gave me. So thank you very much. Thank you. Oh. When we cry, that'll be like the worst thing that could happen now, wouldn't it? If I'm in tears for the rest of the hour. I just thought I'd let you know. So um, we're going to open up the floor to questions. Let me just have a, a look at the chat and see what's been going on. Um, I've been so gross. I haven't really been paying attention, I'm afraid. Sorry. <laughs> um, one moment. Uh, close this. And here's the chat. It's not currently showing me anything. One moment. Just reopen it. Is there anything in the chat at all? Perhaps everyone's just been... Um, did you see anything in the chat, Caroline? I can't see anything in the chat, but if anyone... Oh, right. To... Everyone's... Oh, here we go. Oh, there's a question <laughs> coming through now. There you go. You've got a question from Arthur. Go right ahead, Arthur. Good evening. That was, uh, that was fascinating for all this insight. Uh, my sort of question is about the current trends we've got with these sort of reality sort of programs, you know, things like the responder and the hospital one and everything else. And I'm really into this sort of stuff. I think it's really, really good. But just the past couple have been out. I've, I've lost it. I don't really find them really at all. You may have the real people behind it. It's supposed to the show Liverpool and everything else. But as you say, you've got to know your craft and know what it's about. It should come from the heart. And I'm looking at some of these programmes at the moment and go, where are they coming from? I don't know where I've been changed or stuff. Everyone's raving about them. And I just don't find them challenging enough. I pick holes in them. I go, well, what's he doing there, you know? This, this is Liverpool. Oh, I've just suddenly found this garage with a dead cat and a rat and a pool of vomit. And that looks so Liverpool. You know, I've got witness, but it's that, you know, it's like some, a bit of a question. It's just about reality shows, yeah. I've missed some of that. Did you hear all of it? Oh, um, I missed a little bit of that off. So are you, co are you commenting just on um, sort of what you perceive to be sort of frivolous writing in, in modern TV? 
Yeah, they've got really strong sort of teams behind them, and it's really written from real people who should know what it's all about. They they all tend to fall into the same sort of trap of trying to portray everything all at once. And there's nice little vignettes or little stories and stuff in there, and it should be more positive. And they gloss over that and just carry on shoveling the shit at you. It's awful. So... Caroline, just on that kind of topic, so how how do you try and keep control of complex plots? How do you um, navigate a, like a complex theme if you're trying to approach something so that you're not sort of um, tackling too much at once? I think I, I get really overwhelmed really easily, but I think what Arthur was saying there as well about um, this kind of, it's so easy to go into a stereotype or to go into like, the tropes of of northern cities and especially Liverpool, you know, I think that so many people have such a negative view of the city that it's really important as writers uh, writing about the city to to bring out more than just these kind of negative cliches and stereotypes that we've seen repeated over and over again about northern cities and especially Liverpool. So I think there's that, that's one thing. Um, in terms of like complex plot that you've just asked for and things like that, um, you can't see behind me, I've got a really clear wall here, but um, I use post-it notes. And um, so I use like post-it notes that I move around and I have a different post-it note for every character. So the character will, you know, I'll plot it out in post-it notes. And then as I'm moving stories around or killing people off or moving them, then I just move it all around. Um, and it looks very chaotic and probably I look like, I'm kind of solving some major crime at the moment, but that's how I do it to keep on keep control of it. I think that planning is essential if you've got any kind of complex situation going on. That's my idea. I don't know if I answered Arthur's question because I struggled to hear that. I think my internet went a bit funny at the same time. That's you know that's uh, are you happy with that, Arthur? Yeah, yes, yeah, that was a uh, succinct. Yeah, it's just a it's just a bugbear of mine, and maybe it needs more professional people to do this to try it properly. From it. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'll go to Patrick with his hand up and then I'll read some from the chat. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Patrick. Yeah, okay. No, before when you said that you write chapter to chapter, um, was you saying that you write chapter to chapter from an overall plot that you've got or you write chapter to chapter, say, well, it's got to this point now, I need to get to... Like yeah. or like like mini individual stories. Yeah, so I and, think and just carry it on in that way. Is that what you meant? Yeah, I think um, when I said like at the beginning that like, my process is different for every novel. So mm-hmm. like when I wrote my debut, I basically kind of had an idea of like the beginning and the end, but I didn't really know what she was going to happen. You know what was going to happen? And at the time, I was just like, you know what? I don't need to plan. I'm just going to write the scenes that I fancy writing then it just got so complicated trying to like put it all together but just writing it as a scene like almost like in a self-contained chapter was a short story Mm -hmm. um but now I realize that that just caused so honestly it caused so much chaos trying to like slot it all together so now I do plan it so now I do kind of plot out almost what's happening in each chapter but then I'll treat the chapters like a short story to make sure they have like a beginning middle end and that sense of you're walking into it and things already exist beforehand and you'll leave the chapter and the story will continue without it. And for me, it helps my brain. It just stops me getting overwhelmed at the idea of writing an entire novel. So I just do chapter by chapter that way. And they're not necessarily long chapters, but it just helps me. No, um, thank you for that because I've been working in a similar way. I have been plotting things out through the grey book going by chapter and I just thought, that's crazy and I shouldn't be doing that. So I'm just glad to know that you do that. That's really give me a lot of peace of mind. So thank you. We can start our own club now then. That's the way <laughs> forward. Yeah. Thanks, Patrick. Um, so we've got a question for Angela. She says, how important do you think a formal qualification is in terms of writing? Would you advise a master's or an undergraduate qualification in order to learn the craft or just the practice itself? Is it is it that enough? <clears throat> Oh, this is a difficult one, given my um, given my position. Right. So I think that for me, um, 
for me it worked um so I have a master's and I've just finished a PhD as well um and I needed that as a justification for the time that I was spending on writing um but I think again it's another trick for my mind it's like I need an excuse to be able to do it whereas other people are probably a lot more disciplined than I am and, and don't need that but I do think like I said before about learning the craft it, I think it's really difficult to you need to get you know in the writing groups you get you learn the craft you get feedback um you there's a different kind of experience that comes from from doing an undergraduate qualification or doing a master's as well but that doesn't mean that it's right for every single person so I don't know the answer to that. I would say it works. I should probably say, yes, everyone do an undergraduate course. LGM, you do a fantastic course. I should probably say that, but I don't think that that's right. It's not right for every person. Um, you'll know what you need, but I do think that workshopping and having a, a support group around you as a writer is, is important. Not just people who are going to read it and go, yeah, your work's amazing because that doesn't help. You want people who are going to read it and go, yeah, this is good, but this is what you need to do to make it better. Um, but maybe, Mikey, you've done an undergraduate. What do you think? Yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, well, I'll tag on to that. I think um, for, for me, I just one one reason that I wanted to go to university was um, to expose myself to um, different types of writing, to be challenged, to go out and read more. And uh, that was that was one of the things and, and be shown uh, things that perhaps I hadn't thought of uh, in terms of um, consuming material. Um, and um, while I didn't find every every single thing useful on the course, it, it did depend on the tutor. Um, I did find it overall really, really um, helpful in improving my writing um, and in knowing what you said, you know, uh, in terms of. Um, sort of group feedback is really really helpful um, and doing it in a sort of safe space where you you know that it's not you know you're not attacking a person you're you're sharing your thoughts on the work and how they can improve it and you do that and everyone has a go at doing it um, I found that really really helpful and useful and I found those sessions great um, and I, I did I did learn those while I, while I was at uni and I did find it very very helpful um, yeah and um, I, I would encourage it. it again you you may find that um that kind of setting isn't the right for, for you personally um and I think that that's fine that you you don't you don't have to go to university to be a great writer um yeah. but you you can pick up a lot of tools that can help you yeah and I think other courses can do it as well or on your own you know I think it's just let's not look for excuses for people not to write there are many great writers who haven't done a university course as well you know it's just for me I needed, I needed to like the excuse for doing it, for doing it, which is <laughs> absolutely pathetic when I'm saying it, but yeah, that's what I needed. Yeah, I, a lot of it was uh, confidence building for me, so I yeah. definitely built confidence from it. Um, so the next question is from um, Sheila. Um, let's have a look. Oh, let's go down. It's not a question. Um, from Lauren. Um, no, <laughs> that was a little question uh, from Mike. Here we go. Um, Mike said, you've talked about finishing. Um, how about where you start? That's a great question. Um, how do you know an idea is something you can work with to develop a longer piece of fiction? How did you know with your work? Um, for me, I know it's a good idea when it doesn't go away, um, which sounds really, really daft. But I read this book called uh, I think it was called Big Magic um and I've forgotten the author which is really shocking my brain's gone it'll I'll remember in a minute Elizabeth Gilbert wrote a book called Big Magic and she talks about this idea of the muse and these ideas coming to you so this idea comes to you and it's like this creative idea it's like almost like a voice it's like a nag and you get the seed and if you ignore it then the idea basically goes all right then screw you and it goes off to the next person and that's why sometimes we read a book and go I had that idea you know how's that happened um and I do like that that kind of I have again a notes book that's just in my eyeline all the times so whenever on my desk I see it and I've got the ideas of the books that like I know what I'm going to write next um so I've started one on this res residency which is fantastic and I know the one I'm going to write after that as well um and for me, it's if the ideas don't go away, 
because sometimes ideas just kind of fly and you forget about them but then there's ones and you, you find yourself thinking about them when you're washing the dishes or you know you're out walking you've got this like niggle of a what's that familiar thought so that's for me it sounds absolutely insane when I'm saying it out loud but that's <laughs> how I know that these ideas are sticking um and also at the moment I am absolutely Oh, I'm so obsessed with um, retelling, like giving voice to lost women. I said that earlier. I'm like, honestly, my, I've just moved house and I'm decorating my walls with just women everywhere. But um, the novel that I have coming out this summer is um, about uh, Mrs. Van Gogh. It's, it's about uh, Joanna Van Gogh Bonger, who was Vincent Van Gogh's sister-in-law. And when he, um, when he died, she inherited all of the paintings and she brought Vincent to the public domain, but nobody talks about her. Her voice story hasn't been told. And that seed for an idea, I went to the Van Gogh Museum and I saw when I was walking around, I saw this tiny little plaque that mentioned her. And that idea stuck with me for two years. And I was like, I need to write, it wouldn't go away. Every time I saw like a Van Gogh picture, I thought about Joanna and I was like, yes, I need to write that. And that novel's out this summer. So I think for me, it's just, it's that nagging doesn't go away. That was really long-winded, but yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> um, I'll tag on to that again. I probably shouldn't, but I will. <laughs> um, <Go on. laughs> um, whenever I start something and it doesn't turn into it, if you think I store it, it's really, really important, particularly with songwriting, because you may find that you come back to it at a late point. Um, so make sure, even if you think, oh God, this is rubbish, it's not going anywhere, keep keep it because you actually find you return to material and you go actually that's really good you know I can use that somewhere else so um that's really my true. you know when I talked about earlier about my really really bad poetry that I wrote as a teenager well in my debut um because the girl was 11 and I had her writing some poetry and everyone will think oh yeah you know it's just an 11 year old but it's like my really bad teenage poetry like there is one of them in there but, you know, it kind of goes like a really an 11 year old who has no idea what they're doing kind of level of poetry. <laughs> so, yeah, you do kind of reuse things all the time. I think that's what's definitely. I, worth I think you'll have to read it out now at the end I of think I will. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody needs to hear that. <laughs> yeah. um, and we've got a question from Louise. She says, what are your thoughts on the own voices trend in fiction, e.g. Um, an able-bodied person must not write the character of a disabled person? This is a, a topic that is causing much discussion. Um, I think like, <sighs> this is a difficult one to answer. I think that like anything in literature, um, there are very strong opinions about what we should and what we shouldn't write. For me, um, if there is awareness, if it is, if it has been written in a way that um, adds awareness and increases um, public knowledge, empathy, and understanding, then I can embrace that, but equally I can embrace the other side of the story as well. Um, I think it's when these voices are taken in a, in a way that um, is, it doesn't really benefit the plot, it's just put in there for the sake of it, um, which is a really, I'm, I'm really sitting on the fence here. I do have stronger opinions on it, but I'm not sure this is the platform for me to express them, but that's my view. Um, that like anything, any voice, anything that's included um, in fiction must be there for a reason and not just to kind of um, take advantage of a, a person's disability or colour or anything. And I do feel really strongly about that. And I've had, I've had something in, in one of my writing, in, in something that I wrote and I got asked a question um, at a literary event, it was my first ever literary event and it was the first question that I got asked. And the character um, in the novel had been raped and some, um, a man from the audience put up his hand, it was my first ever question, and he said, I want to know, have you been raped? And I think that this does open many discussions about fiction and real life and that overlap as well. I think that's probably a, a topic for a different a different um, subject really but I do it, it's 
I could talk about this for hours and I'm sure it's a, it's a conversation that could lead to lots and lots of discussions. Brilliant. Well, thank you for that question, Louise. That was a really good one. Um, so uh, Lee is asking, would you ever consider writing in a different genre, um, e.g. sci-fi? Oh, see, I do like sci-fi because I love world building. Um, and I wrote a short story collection, which is um, all the short stories, um, everyone had a superpower in them. And it was um, an illustrated short story collection. So all the illustrations were like in cartoon kind of, um, like a cartoon kind of approach to it. So they had some comic strips in there as well. I, I you know, I'm probably gonna say I'm never gonna write science fiction um, because I, I don't think I have the skills necessary to do it. I think that's the other thing. I don't think every writer can ever write every genre. Um, his writing historical fiction is really hard. So that's what I'm writing at the moment. Um, so you never say never, who knows? Maybe I'll write science fiction. It'll be under a different name if I do. Um, yeah, because I do have to write under different names every time I write a different genre. So, but that's another topic. Caroline Kale. <laughs> <laughs> Could be anything, um, yeah. Um, let's have a look. Um, one second. Lots of lovely feedback. Um, Alex A is asking a question that sort of touches on both Angela's and Mike's questions. Would you ever consider having a good idea? Would you consider having a good idea whether or not you have writing qualifications to be a start towards something new and experimental? Would you consider having a good idea whether or not? Yeah, I think we're, we're back to this. I don't think that you need uh, write, uh, writing qualification to be able to write. You are, you are, you are yeah. Alex is right. I think a good idea, good fiction, good ideas is um, essential when writing things. Is that the question, do you think? Not having to be a, a start towards something new experiment? I think so, yeah, because underneath, I think we touched on it before, didn't we, when we were speaking, they've said, we've, we've kind of answered that. Yeah, okay. Um, and I think there was one more. Uh, no, so that's that's. It's a, do you want to ask a burning question? Oh, Andy B's got his hand up there. Just need to unmute yourself there, Andy. There that we right? Are. That's okay. right. Just well, while you're looking for things, I'm just thinking of an article in the Guardian today where David Mitchell, I think it was, talking about all the influences on his writing, and they were all science fiction um, or fantasy, which isn't what he does, of course. There's, uh, and also I was thinking of Kingsley Amis, who was the most rabid science fiction fan, and he never wrote science fiction. He, he edited books of science fiction, yeah. uh, but he always said, whatever success I've had, I can't write science fiction. Yeah, I think it's about holding your hands up and saying, you know what, I don't think I can write it. But... Um... But I did want to say that about historical fiction, and now I'm writing historical fiction. So never say never. You know, you don't know. <laughs> it's just that I only started writing well after I'd retired. And I knew um, that Tempest Fugit and all that, I was, uh, didn't have much time. I was going to write six different things. And my book was going to have all those six things in it. And wow. gradually those six things all disappeared science fiction, time for King Arthur, all the things I wanted to write about. Suddenly I realised I'm too interested in them. I can't write those things. They just went away. Just that sounds really interesting, yeah. Yeah, okay. Brilliant, thank you, Andy. I've got a question there. Is it Kaltum? Uh, Andrea. Oh, um, Andrea. We've got someone with the hand up as well. We'll go to... Um, Just get you to me. Well, Andrea says, do you have any advice using a pseudonym? Does it complicate marketing? Um, I use uh, Caroline Smales and I use Caroline Wallace. So Caroline Smales is for my experimental fiction. Caroline Wallace is for my commercial fiction. And the novel that I have out this year is Caroline Kauke, uh, which is my middle name. Um, and that's going to be for historical fiction. Does it complicate marketing? Yes, it does. Um, but also I'm very open about it. And um, 
I'll use the names across my social media to make sure that everyone knows. I don't like it when you have um, authors who use pseudonyms and don't make that public knowledge. And, you know, and I think that it's sometimes just easier to be very open about it. Um, it does complicate marketing, but it also means that every time um, my books are being sold abroad, when I change my name, they're sold as a debut, which makes them more interesting to publishers abroad for some reason. So it, it increases uh, foreign right sales as well. So my advice, just that's what I'm doing, is that I'm very open about my pseudonyms and they all link together and they'll link together on Amazon and things like that as well. But what I'm trying not to do is complicate my reader. So a reader who likes my experimental fiction might not necessarily like my historical fiction. And if I use the same names for both, then I'm going to lose readers. So I have to keep my name separately. So I'm, I've got a contract with my reader that's basically saying, this is what you're going to get. If you get Caroline Smales, you're going to get experimental. If you get Caroline Kauke, you're going to get historical. If you get Caroline Wallace, you're going to get commercial. So that's that's how I do it. So you're basically three people. I am. <laughs> really complicated. If I'm Caroline for all of them, I don't think I could change my first name as well. I think that would just be horrendous. Um, and we got a question. Someone's got the hand up. Uh, forgive me. Forgive my ignorance if I'm pronouncing it wrong. It's uh, Kaltium. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Caroline, for, for giving us. Um, yeah. Sorry, I can't. We can't quite hear you there. Yeah. Sorry about that. If you have what what kind of microphone are you using? Okay, yeah, so I'm I'm okay with it. The mic is okay. So thank you so much, um, Caroline, for for the breakdown of your um, writing journey. Can you hear me? We can't hear you very clearly, unfortunately. I'm very sorry about that. Uh, would you be able to write it in the chat? We'll be happy to um, answer your question if you write it in the chat. Bit of a technical problem there. Uh, we'll just go to while um, while you're writing that in the chat. We'll go to another question here um, or comment. So, um, oh yeah, so it's a comment about because uh, you said you didn't read a book till you were sixteen. Is that right? Yeah. She said that um, Andrea Levy, who wrote a small island, didn't read a book until she was eighteen. Wow. Good lord. Yeah, I think um, not proud of that. Not proud of the fact that I um, didn't read a book till I was sixteen. I just. Um, I was fascinated by books, you know, and, and I, I, there was a school friend who had all the um, hardback of the Enid Blyton collection. They're like these beautiful hardback books, all in bright, really bright colours. And she had um, the whole collection of them. And I remember just going into a room and looking at them and thinking, oh my God, I just want to own these books. I just want to have this. They're like Mr. Galliano's Circus and all these wonderful titles. And um, yeah, so I, I was I was interested in it, but just didn't didn't have parents who read, didn't, you know, it wasn't, it was seen as a luxury item. It wasn't something, now I have so many books, um, far too many books. I'm sure that I'm just trying to make up for it. And I have started collecting those hardback, you know, biting books, looking for them in charity shops and whatnot to kind of, you know, yeah, fulfilling some need that I had when I was a kid. But um, I do feel like I missed out on so much, you know, and um, I did go on to read every everything. Like from that age, it was kind of a an unleashing and I couldn't get enough of reading everything. But yeah, there's this sadness of there's so much, you know, I didn't I didn't know I didn't know how to read aloud and there's so much there's so much you miss out on from not having books. Um but thankfully society is very different now. Well, in some places. <laughs> yeah. Have we got a question coming through there? Um, I think so. it's a only partial. Um, we'll just give you a minute to um, to send that again, and then we'll do a wrap up. Okay, great. Um, so what I'll do is I'll do I'll start doing the wrap up, and then when the question comes in, we'll do that. So um, just a reminder that. Uh, Caroline's first workshop takes place tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. Um, I'll actually put that in the chat. I've got a link here pre um, prepared. And here we are. So if you click on that link, if you haven't booked on already, you can book onto that. And the workshop will be on how to write convincing dialogue, which 
Um, Caroline admitted that she didn't begin knowing, but I'm, I'm sure you've learned since she had so many novels out. <laughs> yeah. I promise I know how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Can't see a question coming in there, so I'll just I'll just start wrapping up. Um, so. Um, Thank you very much for attending, everyone. Thank you so much, Caroline. You've been so insightful. Um, and uh, I do miss being a talk by you. I've, you're just the most amazing person ever. Um, so um, make sure that you go to writingonthewall.org.uk and click on the tab that says Writer's Block, and you will find um, all of the upcoming events from Caroline's uh, upcoming three-week residency. Um, this has been an amazing blast off, I think. Um, and uh, I definitely recommend coming along to the workshops, Black Socials, and booking into those one-to-ones because Caroline is a fantastic teacher. So she, she, please take uh, advantage of her expertise. Um, and then we've got the question that's just come in and then we'll wrap up. Uh, you mentioned that as a writer, we should be careful on what we put out there from our personal life. Uh, she just wants to know a little bit more about your advice on that. Okay, I think plugging my own sessions here, I am going to be doing um, a talk on um, social media and the author, which I think, I'm just looking to see when that is, hold on a second, Um, because I will definitely, it's what I'm going to, that's going to be on Monday the 21st, I think, at six o'clock, it's the Block Social 2 event, and I'm going to talk about about this, about um, an author persona and what, how you should use social media um but in the meantime and quickly I would say that like anything what we put out there you know the first thing that any agent is going to do and any publisher is going to do is they're going to google you and what are they going to find so I think that you do we do need to be careful and you've also got to think about when you're mega successful then you know what do you want out there how do you want this how do you want to look how do you want what you know what opinions are you putting out there just it's kind of standard stuff now, um, but I will go into that at that session a bit more, but just hold back, I think is the answer and protect whoever you need to protect. Um, I, I mean, it's completely different now. I was really naive in 2013 and social media was, was different than it is now again, but I'll talk about that in that session if that's okay. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Caroline. Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, and I hope you have a really lovely evening. Thank you.